哈喽，大家好，欢迎来到洛杉矶华人资讯网的直播现场，我是主播莉亚。在华人的传统观点当中呢，传承下一代是非常重要的话题。然而呢，由于现代社会压力加大，生育呢也变得越来越有挑战。那很多人呢是将目光投向了辅助生殖技术，选择试管婴儿或者是在美国做代孕。那么今天呢，我们也非常荣幸的邀请到美国著名的试管婴儿 IVF 专家，他也是 HRC 生育中心主席 Dr. Wilcox。Dr. Wilcox 在辅助生殖领域呢。有着数十年的经验，曾经荣获多个医学奖项。他曾经帮助数千个中国不孕家庭实现他们的子女梦。他所担任主席院长的 HRC 生殖中心也被美国 Newsweek 新闻周刊评价为美国最佳生育诊所。那在本期节目当中呢，我们将再次邀请 Dr. Wilcox 回来为我们讲解他是如何缔造生命奇迹的，华人夫妻是如何寻求试管或者是代孕帮助。Hello, Dr. Wilcox. Thank you so much for coming back. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me back, Leah. Great to be back. Hopefully, we can talk about things people are interested in. Great. So, Dr. Wilcox, you are widely recognized as Dr. Miracle for your achievements in fertility. And what challenges do you face most often in your line of the work? Well, you know, it's interesting you ask because、uh, you know you have to have a certain personality type, in my opinion,、uh, to really excel as a fertility specialist. I mean, if you think about what we do. Uh, it's a challenge for every single case that we see,、uh, and then we have three minutes to celebrate, and then we have the next case behind it, and we continue to struggle. So you have to have the mindset that you don't mind working long hours, seven days a week, and you're、mm-hmm. constantly struggling to achieve that goal. And you get a very short period to celebrate, and then you move on to the next case. So if you have that mindset, you like to challenge yourself, you like to struggle, then this is a great specialty, and I certainly gravitated to that. I had.、Uh, I、had to put myself through school, and nothing was ever easy for me. I, I found that、uh, somehow that it became ingrained in my personality. I like I like to work hard, and I like to struggle to achieve our goals. So, for me, this is a natural fit、uh, to be in fertility and constantly helping people achieve their goals and and have their baby. So,、uh, your generosity extends far beyond the clinic. And can you tell me、uh, about your approach to the charity work and why it is so significant to you as a professional? Well, in particular, we're talking about China, and、uh, you know, with the two-child policy,、uh, it opened up the opportunities for patients from China to come to the U.S. to do fertility treatment. And there was so much need,、uh, especially back in、uh, early 2013, 2014, 2015,、uh, when we would go out to China to put on、uh, free seminars for patients.、Mm-hmm. It was incredible、uh, how many people would attend those seminars. We'd have 600, 800 people. Uh, in the in the、uh, seminars, and they would run all day. And、uh, the thing I remember the most were the afternoons where we、uh, would take questions and answers, and they could run five or six hours, and no one left.、Mm-hmm. No one left、uh, that room. They were glued to their seats.、Uh, there was so much need and so much interest in、uh, fertility and the opportunities that we presented from the U.S. So it was a a really a unbelievable experience to get to be part of that. And、uh, we used to make two or three trips、uh, every year before COVID, and、uh, had a lot of success meeting people from different cities and、uh, introducing what we could do in the U.S. to China.、Mm-hmm. So, any other like upcoming plans、um, to connect these Chinese community, maybe in the, this year? Yeah, so we have、uh, seminars that run throughout the year. I think the next one is in April. We have two doctors from our group going out to China to do the seminar. Uh, and these seminars are unbelievably well attended, and I think it's a great opportunity if you're a prospective patient in China, thinking about fertility, thinking about what your options are. Even if you're not planning to go to the U.S.,、mm-hmm. you know, there's a benefit to hearing what's what's available and learning more about fertility.、Um, most people still don't realize that you need to be seen before you're 38 if you're very serious about preserving or extending the reproductive window. So even if you're not thinking about having a baby, you should be doing something、uh, before you're 38. So these seminars are incredibly informative for patients who need to go overseas for egg donation, surrogacy, or gender selection. Those are things that、uh, can be briefly discussed. But ultimately, there's a lot of、uh, patients in、uh, need in China today, and、uh, you know, they, if they can afford to come to the U.S.,、uh, we do everything we can to try to help them make that journey and、uh, and support them. Got it. So, for those people consider traveling to the U.S. for IVF or surrogacy, like, could you please walk us through the process? Is it possible to begin the consultations while they are still in China? 
Yeah, so we try to make it convenient time-wise. Uh, we start really early in the morning or we do late afternoon consults just with time difference uh, to try to make it convenient for patients in China. But we usually will do a 30-minute brief consultation and to make it more efficient, uh, usually there are agents that will work with the patient. So you need to contact an agent. The benefit to you of getting an agent is that it facilitates the whole process. You'll get some testing done before the consultation so we can be more specific about what we can do for the patient. Usually you'll get an ultrasound to check the ovaries, count the follicles. These are, And we also usually get a blood test for a product called AMH or anti-malarian hormone. And when appropriate, if there's a partner, we'll get a semen analysis. So we can start with those things uh, and get a pretty good, good picture of what we can uh, do for them. The ultrasound will usually include a, a brief overview of the uterus as well. So thankfully, most women don't have major uterine factor, but in those cases where they have fibroids or, or other conditions that may make it more difficult to conceive, uh, we can discuss that during the consultation. So in 30 minutes, if I have all those studies available to me, I can give you a clear uh, indication of what I think you need to do and uh, whether or not I can help you. Got it. So for Chinese families considering surrogacy, I mean, it is not allowed in China right now, but it is definitely allowed, you know, in the U.S. And how do you assist them in navigating this complex issue and help them to go, you know, um, go over this obstacle? Surrogacy definitely is one of the more complicated uh, things that we do uh, in reproductive medicine because you have a third party, right? You've got to find the appropriate candidate to carry the baby. And uh, that's where the large programs, I think, have a huge advantage. I mean, my practice alone, we do about 400 surrogacy cases a year. So we have the uh, huge uh, capability or capacity to screen the surrogates. Uh, we go through a maternal fetal assessment. So we use a high risk OB specialist to assess our surrogates to make sure they're good candidates. We can clearly define most of the risk factors for them being pregnant and we can relay that information to the couple. And then we obviously can uh, provide the fertility treatment to uh, maximize the probabilities for success for pregnancy. And then we make sure they're plugged into an OBGYN at the end of the 10 weeks that we spend with the, with the surrogates. So it's, it's more complicated. There are agents uh, not only bringing patients to us, but there are also agencies that recruit surrogates. And then we have a team of highly experienced personnel that will uh, navigate the entire process. Remember, this is a legalized adoption. So we need to make sure that all the contracts are done properly so that you don't have any issues adopting your baby after the delivery mm -hmm. and safely taking your baby home. So we're definitely one of the few programs that does so many surrogacy cases. And uh, we're grateful to have patients choosing us uh, when they need to use a surrogate. So how much it would cost, I mean, for the surrogacy services? I mean, could you please give them a clue, probably? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, you know, surrogacy is not inexpensive. Uh, you've got uh, so many different layers to the treatment. You've got to pay the attorneys. You've got to pay the agent who found the surrogate. You've got to pay the surrogate. You've got to pay the fertility treatment. Uh, so it's, you know, multiple layers. Uh, if you need to use an egg donor, that's another layer. So. We usually we'll quote you know, somewhere between 150 to 200,000. Um, that, that usually will cover most. Now the agencies will vary, the surrogate compensation will vary. If the surrogate's been a surrogate before, then sometimes she'll get a premium because she's considered uh, a little more reliable uh, because she's done it before. But ultimately I think safely 150 to 200,000 is a reasonable expectation. And uh, if it runs a little bit more than that, uh, at least you're in the ballpark. So uh, is in the beginning of the 2024, any like wishes or blessing for our Chinese patients? Well, you know, we're so grateful to have made it through COVID, right? COVID was the most disruptive uh, event I think any of us hopefully will ever experience again in our lives. It was uh, unbelievably uh, disruptive to our practice, our international patients. It wasn't really until last year that things opened up and we were able to start seeing patients from Europe in large numbers and, and from China. So obviously 2024, more of the same. Uh, year of the Dragon, what a great year that is. It was actually the first year that we started seeing a lot of patients was the Year of the Dragon uh, 12 years ago. So ultimately, uh, it's a special year to me uh, because it made me aware of the Chinese need, uh, to be fair, uh, 12 years ago. So hopefully everybody has a great year this year and uh, Happy New Year. 
Great. Uh, I know that you guys, uh, you guys really have a huge practice and have so many locations. Is the Pasadena location will be the first choice for like uh, how would they like uh, relocate it if for these people traveling from China? So we try to accommodate patients in all of our locations. So ultimately, I think the patients have the opportunity to go to any of the locations to see our doctors. Um, um, you know, Pasadena is one of our largest centers. Obviously, uh, we have a lot of Mandarin-speaking personnel, and it makes things a little bit easier for the majority of the patients. But ultimately, you can go to any of our locations if you have family in that area, or if you have specific needs, or you know, you want to do tourism. It's closer for a variety of reasons uh, to the things you want to do. Then you know, you can pick any of our locations. Great. Any waiting list if they're you know especially looking for you. <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, we we uh, as long as I'm willing to work uh, 12 hours a day, seven days a week, there's really no waiting list. We'll try to accommodate patients whenever they need to be seen. Um, I enjoy what I do. I I, I really don't uh, see myself slowing down anytime soon. But no, there's no waiting list. If you really want to see me, Linda finds a way. My my primary nurse coordinator finds a way to get you an appointment. So great, we can accommodate so virtually these needs. 那么如果大家有感兴趣的话都可以去拨打中文咨询电话 Dr. Wilcox 的助理也是护士长 Linda 20699-7700 或者我们请导播老师放下 Dr. Wilcox的二维码 或者是扫描 Linda的二维码来进行中文咨询也可以的 那么在上一期呢 Dr. Wilcox 已经为我们介绍了一系列有关于就是 Dr. Wilcox Thank you so much for joining us today. We're looking forward to talking to you soon, maybe in the next episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Leah. Thank you. Great. Bye-bye. 下一个问题是来自湖北的孙女士,今年是十四岁。她的问题是2013年开始做试管,每次取了两个,能配成两个胚胎,一直六次。三次都是没有着床的一次生化两次在四十天左右胎停了做试管的医生说年龄大可能是胚胎质量的问题检查免疫和狼疮抗凝物有点弱阳性这个周期查在FCH是5.04AMH0.21 Yes, yes. The good news is in America we've shown that as long as the female is healthy and there is no major pathology with the uterus, you can safely carry a pregnancy up to age 50. The lupus anticoagulant antibodies are in the low to moderate range, which is not clinically significant, should not pose a major problem for her carrying a pregnancy. This patient should do very well with egg donation based on what we've been told. Ti 醫生說由於暖少就不建議養囊,最後一次發現有巧克力囊腫擔心著床會有問題,還有沒有機會自己取卵自己做試管呢?希望希望能有一個時機就還有chance to get this successful. So this actually brings up a really important point that we have uh, identified in our center. There's always been a conundrum, should we grow the embryos in the body or should we grow the embryos in the laboratory? Mm -hmm. 呃，医生说呢，这是一个很好的例子呢，就是让我们来研究呢，我们应该是养囊呢，还是说早一点做移植？If the lab conditions are not extraordinarily favorable for blastocyst culture and development, day three transfer is the best you can do. 如果呢，这个医院的实验室不达标，也就是养囊的技术没有过关的话，医生是建议可以做三天的啊移植，就早一点做移植。
Unfortunately, that severely handicaps your ability to troubleshoot for the patient and identify if they're still fertile. 但是问题是这样做移植以后，有很多是不健康的胚胎，我们没办法做判定，有可能是什怎样的原因造成的失败，有可能是胚胎，也有可能是子宫。So, the doctor in China is giving her good advice. In our IVF center in China, we recommend early transfer、mm -hmm. if you're having difficulty growing the embryos. He thinks the foreign doctor gave you advice is right. If the foreign doctor's hospital has no faith in this, if they have good technology to grow an embryo, then of course, they will do early transfer. We looked at our data when we were doing day three biopsies for genetic testing and confirmed that if the embryo was genetically normal, it would reach blastocyst in our laboratory. 嗯，那在我们这边呢，我们做了很多呃实践的验证。我们是把三天的胚胎呢取细胞拿去做基因筛查，看第五天的情况怎么样，能不能做移植。那我们发现呢，就是胚胎能长到呃第五天基因健康的，也都是形成囊胚了。We also confirmed that the embryos that were profoundly abnormal were the ones that were resting. 嗯，那我们发现，如果是染色体不健康的，是长不到囊胚的。So if your IVF laboratory is able to consistently grow the normal embryos to viability,、mm -hmm. it is definitely in your best interest not only to do day five transfer, but to do genetic testing to confirm the patient's still fertile. 如果说这个医院的实验室达标的，养龙技术非常过关的，那医生是建议做囊胚。这样我们不但来确定胚胎是不是有可以养到囊胚，同时可以做基因筛查。来看这个染色体是不是完全健康的，在移植前我们就确定胚胎是不是有问题的。Although this patient is still only 34, she has severe endometriosis with an endometrioma. 虽然您的这个王女士呢很年轻，但是有巧克力囊肿，确实影响了这个卵巢功能的。This has dramatically re dramatically reduced her egg reserve. 这样就让你的这卵巢功能急剧的下降。When you look at the data for IVF, success rates are lower for patients with stage three and stage four endometriosis. 那当我们呃看一个统计报告，如果是巧克力囊肿，也就是子宫内膜移位症，是达到三度或四度的话，这个怀孕的成功率是降低很多的。Not only is it more difficult to get genetically normal embryos, but the uterus is usually involved by an adenomyosis. 不但是卵巢功能呃有了影响，很难取到健康的胚胎。同时呢，在子宫情况也受定了，受到了一定的影响，也就是说着床率也降低的。Adenomyosis is similar to endometriosis, but the glandular tissue in the uterine cavity migrates into the muscle layer, causing thickening of the tissue, calcification, and reduced blood flow. 很多情况呢，子宫内膜移位症和这个子宫腺体症是合并存在的。那子宫那个内膜移位症，像我们知道的，像巧克力囊肿，但是子宫的腺体症是不一样的，主要是子宫的内膜组织跟子宫基层组织呢。混在一起变得界限不清，所以的这个子宫的血流的供应就变差了，这样会降低的着床成功率的。This can profoundly reduce implantation rates. 嗯，所以我们如果是非常严重的腺体症的问题的，着床的成功率会影响很多。If she was adamant about trying to carry, and we were fortunate to get a normal embryo, we've had some success giving depolupron and creating a menopause state for three months prior to priming her for her transfer. 如果说我们幸运的做试管有健康的胚胎，您还是很想要自己怀的话呢，我们呢可以用这种，呃，叫达菲林注射三个月的方案，让你的这个子宫呢状态变得更好一些，可以安排移植。So I think it's important to realize you have to treat the whole problem, not just part of the problem. 还有呢，您要清楚的认识到，您现在不只是有一个问题，可能整体的都要做治疗。